material uh, for this passage uh, this afternoon, this morning, is uh, that Christ is cru- going to be crucified, right? And that's why, you know, we have this later discussion, verses 36 through 38, where Peter basically asks, oh, hey, you know, what's going to happen here? Simon Peter said, this is John chapter, it's on your sheet there, uh, John chapter 13, verses 36 through 38 says, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, uh, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And Peter said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered, Wilt thou lay down the, thy life for my sake? Verily I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me Excuse me, thrice. So um, that's the length of repression. I, you know, we always want to stay on a positive note here. You know, the nice thing about Frank, he could have just read it from his sheet here, but he didn't. He had his Bible with him. So that was really impressive, Frank. Thank you. Um, and you guys always need to make sure you bring a Bible. Even though I try to provide all the scriptures on, on, this, on, the, uh, on the screen or either on your sheet of paper, uh, do bring your Bible. Don't leave your Bible at home. You know, make sure to have it with you. And I thought that I appreciated that example. And read out of your Bible. Even follow along if you can. You know, I know sometimes it's difficult for some of us to try to flip the pages and make sure we're at the right spot at the right time. It's easier just to look up there. But if you can, follow along in your Bible, especially if you prefer a different version for whatever reason. You like, uh, you don't, King James doesn't fit you very well. It's hard for you to understand. You prefer your version. You know, bring your own version and, and compare that and uh, see the differences and things like that. So those are all good things. A um, couple things I want to mention before I dive into my sermon here. Uh, we're all going to be coming up uh, September 15th. We're restarting our discipleship class on Friday mornings. Uh, that's at 10 o'clock uh, at the Parsonage. We really encourage you to be there. Even if you've missed the first half of it, we're about I mean, a little over halfway through. I uh, hope to finish up this year. Um, even if you missed the first part, the, the second part is still very relevant. You can, you can almost dive into this study almost at any point and still really enjoy it. The last half is very practical information, uh, dealing with finances, dealing with uh, family relationships. What does God say about all the different areas of our lives? And I think that's so important, and I really strongly recommend and encourage you uh, to get a part, become a part of that uh, Friday morning Bible study. Uh, and, and like I said, even if you've missed a couple of classes before, don't worry about it. Just jump in. We'll get you a notebook. We'll get you on the right page. And it's not a problem. Each of the lessons are, you know, they're, they fit to, together. They're not dependent on the ones previous. Uh, you can easily understand where we're at it, without just stepping right on in. So really encourage everyone, Friday mornings, 10 o'clock, and that's going to restart on September 5th. Uh, if you can make it, really would love to have you. If you cannot make... Friday mornings at 10 o'clock, uh, let me know. We'll start another group and, and try to work through, especially if you have missed all the first half, uh, try to work through. It's so important that we go through, there's, there's only so much, I know I preach a really long time, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, part of the reason I preach a long time is because there's so much that needs to be taught. You know, like Paul said, hey, you know, I only get to the milk here. I'd love to get to some of the meat, to some of the, uh, the deep uh, thoughts of Scripture that apply to some more practical levels of your life. And if you only come on Sunday mornings, you're really not getting enough. And that's one of the things you might have noticed that we've kind of sh- uh, shortened our sharing time last week. But part of the reason for that is because we really want you to get involved in some kind of midweek study. Uh, whether that's the ladies' Bible study, we have ladies' Bible study, we also have men's Bible study, and come and share your prayer requests there. You should be sharing your prayer requests there because those are really close fellowships that we can pray more intimately uh, for the needs and, and deal with them more specifically in those kind of those group settings. So if you're not involved in women's Bible study or men's Bible study, let me know or you want another time or something like that. We'll get together. We want to try to make sure that everyone has that opportunity to get fed during the week. Uh, because we can only deal with so much on Sunday. And we really can't tailor it to your specific needs. Uh, sometimes it works out that way, praise the Lord. Uh, but part of the benefits of coming together on a weekly study is we can tailor it more to your specific needs, where you're at in your life, uh, different things, questions you might be dealing with. You know, how, how many of us have questions? If you're not asking questions, you're not growing in the Lord. Uh, that's period. I mean, we all need to be asking questions all the time, saying, hey, is there something in God's Word that I'm not understanding that I need to know more about? And uh, just be uh, involved in those kind of studies. And if you're not, get plugged into one. Uh, The men's Bible study is just tremendous. I hear wonderful things about the ladies' Bible study. Uh, So both of those are great opportunities to be involved in. 
I uh, just want to mention a few things. Now, let's go ahead and get into John chapter 13, uh, verses 38, well, 31 through 38. Sorry, we're not in 12, we're in 31 through 38. Uh, you'll also notice that I did not highlight the scriptures. I apologize, that was my mind blank. Uh, the scriptures that will be on the screen. But you'll notice that there'll be some that will say verses, and it'll just have the verse number. Those verses are on your sheet of paper, right? Directly above your, sheet, your, your notes there. Uh, those are all in John chapter 13, verses 31. You just have to look up there, and those verses, you'll, you'll see verse 31, verse 32, and they'll be referenced in the notes. And then in lengthy uh, scripture references, they'll say like Galatians, whatever, those will be up on the screen, provided to you by uh, Roy as he goes through those. So just so you know, they're not highlighted, but that's, that's going to be the difference. I'll try to make sure to do that next week. But uh, yeah, so you have all of your John passage right there in front of you, and then the additional scripture references that I mentioned will be up on the screen, just so you know, unless I throw an oddball in, which happens from time to time. Uh, but that, there, that's the reason you need to bring your Bible and, and bring it with you. So here we are, John chapter 13, verses 31 through 38. We're actually finishing up John chapter uh, 13 to kind of contextualize this a little bit. Uh, the first part of John, we have Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Again, I just love how uh, we could preach this sermon about this passage where Jesus is really giving us the greatest commandment. And that's the title of my message this morning. It's, it, this is the greatest commandment. This is the absolute uh, hierarchy pinnacle of what it means to be a Christian, a believer, a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what Christ actually says in this passage. He says, hey, if you want to qualify yourself or quantify yourself as a disciple of mine, this is what you're going to have to be following. This is what you're going to have to be doing. Uh, this is what you're going to have to be taking part in, uh, of course, with God's grace and his enabling power. But I love the fact that Jesus doesn't just say these words, but he sandwiches this, really, with action. And that's, that's the real key to what is being said here. If we just read these words, love one another as I have loved you, and we just simply take this as some kind of nebulous, abstract concept, we're missing the entire point. Uh, because love is not just a feeling. Yes, love can be a feeling. I know some of you, you remember that time when you first fell in love, you saw that person, you looked in their eyes, and yes, all this it can be a feeling, it, that's part of it, but love is more than that. It's an action as well. It's, it, it's something that we do, something that, we, that motivates us, something that uh, makes us do things. And Christ, first of all, humbles himself in this beautiful way, washes their feet in the beginning of the chapter, and then we have this discussion, and we're really... Actually, even though we're only halfway through the Gospel of John, we're really towards the end of the story, and that's what Jesus Christ is predicting, the pinnacle moment of history, and that is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and that's the pinnacle we talked about this morning in Sunday School class. Again, if you're missing out on Sunday School class, come to Sunday School class. We had a wonderful time. Father, got, Father-in-law got the opportunity to teach that this morning. But he's talking about the original sin, the fact that we're all under the curse of Adam's first sin. I know us men, we st- we're, we're still hung up on blaming Eve, but it was Adam. Uh, scripture very clearly says that in the New Testament. Adam's first sin uh, that made us all sinners. And we're still stuck under that curse. But the beautiful thing is, is God didn't go, oh no, what am I going to do now? No, God said, no, I'm going to glorify my name, my son's name through this by showing the ultimate act of love. And that is Christ laying down his life for us. Because this is the only way. There is no other, we talked about getting back into the Garden of Eden. There's no other way back to utopia. You know, some of you remember uh, back in school being re- the, the book called Utopia. Uh, there's no way back to utopia, back to the Garden of Eden, without Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ is going to be saying through this passage. So here we have the greatest commandment. Let's look at first year at verses 31 through 32. And you'll see that right on your page. Uh, John 13, verses 31 through 32. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So what just happened here, we remember Judas has just left the room. Jesus has almost sent him out, if you remember from the last passage. Uh, Jesus, Jesus sends him out, and he goes out basically to betray Jesus, to take that 30 pieces of silver and then exchange that for information. He's in such and such place. You can now go arrest him. Because what was the Pharisees' greatest fear? Their fear was arresting him during the day because there were all these people around. If they saw it happen, they would have made some resistance. Uh, things could have gone very terribly wrong for them. So they knew they had to do this act at night. They needed to do this under the cover of darkness. And for that, they needed someone on the inside to let them know exactly 
where Jesus was so they could quickly and efficiently find him, take him, take him to trial in the middle of the night. Trials were never held at night. Try him in the middle of the night and crucify him early the next morning before people would be aware of what had even happened. So here's Judas. He's just betrayed him. And what does Jesus say about it? Does he say something nasty about Judas? Does he say something, oh, well, you know, Judas is, is doing what he, he, he does best? No, he says, in this moment is the Son of Man going to be glorified, referring to himself, and God is glorified. Not just Jesus Christ, but also God is glorified through what is about to happen. If God be glorified in him, God also shall glorify him in himself and straight shall straightway glorify him. See, what's the ultimate purpose of man? We've actually talked about that in our Sunday school. What is the chief end of man? Right? To what? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our chief end. Our first purpose is to glorify God, to bring glory to God. And it does bring glory to God, what Jesus Christ is doing. And when we accept what he did for us in his life, that also brings glory to God. That's why, you know, throughout most of history, you know, in the Western world, we refer to history leading up to this point as what? Uh, B.C., before Christ, and leading away from him, A.D., Adonai, uh, Domini, which is the year of our Lord, everything leading away from that uh, moment in time in history. And we mark history by this moment uh, because it's important. Now, I know scholarly world, they're trying to change that. Uh, into some other uh, different letters and different meanings. But this is the point. This is the main point of history, uh, the ultimate moment in history, the ultimate act of love. And this is a father, and both the father and the son are glorified in this ultimate act of love, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4 says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What basically Paul is saying is he's giving us a short uh, gospel message. He says, hey, Jesus Christ himself uh, here in this passage gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us, right? Deliver us from that original sin. For those of you in Sunday school class, that curse, that original curse, the destruction, uh, that, that sin is brought upon us from this present evil world according to what? The will of God the Father. Here again, we have both. Uh, sometimes we think of, yeah, in the New Testament, Jesus is the loving God, and the Old Testament, God of the Old Testament, is this some kind of angry, vengeful God? No. What's been the point of John all along? Is Jesus is saying over and over again, I am that I am. He's identifying himself with the God of the Old Testament. Even John 3.16, right, which hopefully you should remember, is it, what does it say? Does it say Jesus for Jesus to love the world? No, for God. The God, the Jewish God of the Old Testament is the one that's initiating this, and he's saying, for God so loved the world. It's not just the Son or separate from the Father, independently acting from the Father. It's God, the Father, and the Son saying, we're getting together. We're doing this together. Think about it. I mean, you can imagine a father and a son. What, you know, a father, <laughs> I mean, any of, any of us in this room who've experienced, you know, the, the joys and the blessings of being a parent, you would give your life in a heartbeat for your son. What's the greatest thing for a father to give up? It's not himself. A father would easily, he'd lay down his life. He loves his son. He would lay down his life easily to save his son. The hardest thing for a father to give up is his son. And that's what the Father, God the Father said, you know what, I'm going to give up the most difficult thing for me to give up, and that is my son for you. And for a son to lay down his own life and to say, hey, it's not about me, it's about saving uh, the people that have rejected us in the first place. That's the whole point of the original sin, is that all of us have rejected God. What does it say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep, Isaiah says, I have gone astray. We're all gone away. And God said, no, I love the world. And I love that qualification. Not just the elect, not just uh, the, those that come to Christ. I love all of them. Even the ones that eventually will reject me and go to hell. God still loves them so much that he wanted them to accept his son, to accept that payment for their sins. John chapter 15, verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, then a man lay down his life for his friends. What does Jesus in the very next verse say to his disciples? He says, you are my friends. So who's he referring to here? He's referring to himself. There is no greater love 
See, we could, we could look for different stories of love. I could probably tell you a whole bunch of different illustrations of acts of love that humans do for each other. But this is the greatest act of love, is what Jesus is saying, for a man to lay down his life for his friends, to step in the way, to take that bullet, to, to take that, that punishment that was meant for us. Christ takes, him, takes it upon himself. This is the ultimate glorious moment in history. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So that's our first point this morning, the crucifixion. And that's what Jesus is predicting. He's telling his disciples, this is coming. Now they really kind of don't get his terminology, what's going on here. Uh, but they're eventually going to look back and understand these words very clearly and realize Jesus was predicting his death. God is going to be glorified in this moment. The ultimate pinnacle moment of history. So Christ doesn't just give us, and that's our next point here, is, is the command. With the crucifixion. The command, the curse. Three points this morning. The, crucifix, the, the crucifixion, of course, is that ultimate moment in history that Jesus is just predicting right now in this, in this passage. And then we have the command. Jesus doesn't just give us this command and then expect us to figure out how to follow it. He shows us, right? We just mentioned he showed us earlier on in this chapter when he washed the disciples' feet. That was something totally culturally unacceptable at that time. A master never washed the feet of his disciples. You never ever did that. You didn't even let someone who was your equal wash your feet. You made sure it was someone who was lower, absolute lowest on the scale of society, and that was a slave. Only a slave washed the feet of anyone. And Christ said, no, I'm going to humble myself to the absolute point. Even what? As it says in, says in uh, Philippians chapter 2, even to the point of a servant, a slave, Christ humbled himself. And that's what he's saying. Hey, I'm not going to just give you this commandment and expect you to figure out how to follow it. I'm going to show you how to follow it. Because let's face it, God gives us commands, right? In the Old Testament, we get all these commands. This is what we're supposed to do. But what's the easiest thing for a human to follow? It's example. How many of you look back in your life and you saw someone that you looked up to? And you decided, you know what, that's the, that's the person I want to pattern my life after. Now, some of us made the mistake of patterning our life after somebody who wasn't very good, maybe. And we followed that really well. But maybe some of us made the choice to say, you know what, that's someone who's older and wiser, knows the truth better than I do, I'm going to pattern myself after that. That's why Jesus doesn't give us just a list of commands. He just says, hey, follow my example. Follow my example. Because we do that. Humans naturally do that. You think about a child. Uh, we, were, we were watching a, a, a funny movie last night. And the kids, they were sitting there next to me. Oh, they're sitting there next to me. They weren't just next to me. They are on top of me, all over me. And we're sitting there watching a funny movie. And what, what, what was pretty typical? You know, if I laughed, they laughed. Right? They're, they're figuring out what's funny. They don't even really know at that age what's funny, what's not funny. And so they, but they were really enjoying it just because I was laughing, and they were laughing too. Even though probably half the jokes they didn't even get. But that's the thing. As you grow older, you follow example. All of us follow. It doesn't matter what age we're at. We follow the example of those who have gone before. And that's what Jesus Christ says. Hey, this is the example. Wash one another's feet. Lay down your life for each other. You know, I was thinking about this morning. We're talking about, again, the original sin. The fact that we're all cursed. You know, we're all <laughs> condemned to die. Uh, and we're all sinners. But you know, you think about the products of us being sinners, right? We think about divorce and broken homes. You know, we wouldn't even get to that point if we were all like Christ, right? Uh, because if we were giving, if we, we went into marriage saying, you know what, it's, it's all about the other person. It's never about me. I'm always going to lay down my life for the other person. Boy, how many of us, yeah, how many of us would want to be married to Jesus? Uh, yeah, no problem, right? I mean, he serves you every single day. He never complains. Uh, it's just no questions asked. He's just loving you all the time. That would be absolutely wonderful. Re really, in a sense, we are married to Jesus, right? He's the perfect, uh, perfect example. But us humans, on the other hand, we go into marriage and we think, oh, this is a 50-50, or at best, this is a you give 100% and I give 100%, and you know, we'll meet somewhere in the middle. No, Christ gives it all, 110, 150%, not even expecting anything in return. And that's the example for this commandment. And that's why Jesus, it's kind of funny that Jesus says, right here, and let's look at this actually, verses 34 through 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. For by this you shall all men know that you are my disciples, and yet you love one to another. You know, it's funny that Jesus says this is a new commandment. Is this really a new commandment? 
I mean, think about it. Let's go back to the Old Testament here for a minute. Let's, let's, uh, let's flip back to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. What does God say to the, Jews, to the Jews of the Israelite nation? What does he say to them? Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt, what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Oh, this, so this kind of commandment is already been given. Actually, so you can find this multiple times in the Old Testament that they were supposed to love one another, uh, to love uh, them uh, as themselves. But I think that the, the difference here, what Jesus Christ is give, giving, it's not necessarily a, a new commandment it's in, in its entirety, but it's a new commandment in its standard. What is a standard, right? Let's just take a moment to define what a standard is, right? A standard is a point of excellence, right? A, a, a place that you can go no further below, right? Uh, you can think of those that, that do inspecting material. They want to make sure that, that it meets the standard, that it, it, it's, it fits that criteria. And we have a somewhat of a new standard. That's our sub first point, a new standard here. It's not, and that's where it's qualified here in this passage. Let's look at this again. As I have what? Loved you, that ye also love one another. And I know... I know some of us get a little hung up on the King James. It's a little bit challenging sometimes because it's some sort of reason. But actually, English was a little bit more precise at that time. And you can really actually understand what Jesus is saying when you have the two different you and ye. And I know we're going to really get into delve into some English class here. I, I apologize. We'll, we'll go through this quickly here. But basically, there is a difference between you and ye. That's why the old King James uses you and ye. Uh, because you, if you travel, some of us know... If you travel to the south, you have you, and you have what? Y'all, right? And there's a difference, right? Because if you're referring to you, what are you referring to? You're referring to one person, singular, you. I'm talking to a friend, I'm just looking at him, I say you. But if I'm referring to a group, it's y'all. And we've had to kind of create that in our language because we've lost in our language that differentiation between ye and you. Ye is singular, you specifically, you is y'all. So if you can look at this passage again, Jesus is saying, as I have loved you as a group, right? As a group of disciples, as I have loved you, laid on my life for you, given my all for you, this is ye, you specifically, supposed to follow this command as that example. That's the difference right there. And if we put just use, we might actually miss the meaning of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, hey, this isn't just a command that we give to the entire church as a general whole for us to follow. No, this is a command for each and every one of you that fill a seat this morning. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's singular. It's you specifically. We don't follow this as a corporate group. We don't follow this as a church. We follow this commandment as you individually. And that's what Jesus is saying is we stand individually accountable before God on this point. If you're going to run around saying, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, which is, should be the meaning of, of, of a Christian, is a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian, then Jesus is saying, this is what should qualify, quantify, be your standard. Remember, example, we follow example, right? We follow example. Christ gives us that example. And he says, hey, this is my example. You specifically need to follow it in reference to all. You know, I remember <laughs> I was reading through commentary by J. Vernon McGee, and he, he threw a funny little treasure of a story in there. And uh, this is a mine. I, I stole it from J. Vernon McGee, so if you want to go read his commentary, you can get his words exactly on it. But he basically tells the story of when he was younger, his parents passed away, he was an orphan, so he went to go live with two aunts who were single and a bachelor uh, uncle who was their brother, uh, and they all lived together. They were all single, and they lived together. They raised J. Vernon McGee. I didn't know this, but uh, J., they, they raised him. And the two aunts, one was a Presbyterian, and one was a Baptist. And the one aunt went to the Presbyterian church, and the one aunt went to the, the Baptist church. And the uncle was never a Christian. All throughout his life, he totally rejected God, wouldn't have anything to do with church or anything like that. And at the end of his life, he passed away, and his, his aunts wondered, why didn't he come to Christ? And J. Verdi McGee said, hey, I, the answer was obvious. See, every time the aunts would come home from church on Sunday afternoon, they would make a meal for their uncle who had not gone to church. 
And the first thing that they would do was complain about all the th nasty things that the Baptists did and all the nasty things that the Presbyterians did. So all those years, the uncle would listen to all the terrible things that the other people did in the, both of those churches. And by the time the end of his life came, he said, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Really, it was a powerful story. We think about it. And how many of us, we're so quick to complain about each, other's, each other as believers. We're so quick to go, oh yeah, I saw so-and-so at church, and you know they, they, they don't do this right, and, and they believe this really weird belief, and, and, and they've got all these, they're, they're wrong about this point in the Bible, and, and, and you, you know, I saw so-and-so being immoral with so-and-so, and we just love to gossip and to tell terrible things. And we don't love each other as Christ loved each other. That's what Jesus is saying is here. Hey, this is the qualifying standard. This is it. This, uh, John chapter 3, verse 11 says, This is the message which ye have heard, what, from the beginning. Really, it's, nothing's changed, nothing's new, just a new standard, that we should love one another. Ephesians chapter 2 in the New Testament here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, excuse me. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice unto God for a sweet-smelling savor. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, Oh, no man, anything, but one thing, one thing, but to love one another. For he, love, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear, bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other command, it is briefly comprehended into this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. See, that's why God gave us all these commands in the first place. Sometimes we like to distort some of these commands and we try to make them misinterpret them and things like that. But God's saying, Hey, I gave you the Ten Commandments originally, all of the law originally, so that you would not offend, so that you would not hurt each other. Because what are all these things in this list? Committing adultery, killing, stealing, bearing false witness, lying about one another. <coughs> coveting another's property. They're offenses against another person. Right? In law, they have to distinguish between what is wrong because it's just the way it's supposed to be. That's wrong. And laws, like speeding laws, that are just, they're wrong because the law says it's wrong. What's the standard there? This is the standard. God's standard. God says, hey, this is something you cannot do to each other. But it's all summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. So we have a new standard, and then we have the standard. And I, I, like, this, I, I like this point, that, that if we look here, and that this is what it says, verse 35. By this shall all men know that you, ye are my disciples. Again, very specific. Ye are my disciples, that if ye love one to another. Again, he reiterates it again, really. In John chapter 13, verse 34, 35, he reiterates it again. It's not you all as a group generally. It's you specifically. So don't come to church and say, well, you know, I saw Kevin, and he is just the most unloving guy. You know, he needs to repent. and come." To no, it's, what am I doing? Am I being loving? Am I following Christ as Christ would have me follow him? <clears throat> it's a standard. I remember as a young man, I, I'm trying to remember how old it was. Uh, I, was probably, I was right in that age where uh, showing physical affection was just the, the worst thing in the world for a young man to do. So some of you probably know, it's probably 12 or 13, 14, you get that age. And I remember my younger sister, and this is nothing against her, she was just a little girl at the time, very, very little, uh, probably about two or three years old, she took one of my comic books, and she felt, you know, they're all black and white, they got lines in there, it looks like a coloring book, so she felt, you know, I'll just color in all these pictures for my brother, probably even was thinking, you know, just an act of kindness, right, you know. But anyways, it was just the absolute last thing in the world that a 14, 13 year old brother would ever want uh, his younger sister to do. So I was very, very upset about it, so I took her to my mother, and I said, you know, here she's, you know, she's colored in my book, and you know what a terrible crime against humanity this is, and you know, you know, we we could go to Nuremberg and have the trials there, or, or you know, we could do it just here. You know, either way, you know, uh, whatever you prefer. 
uh, just as long as there's some serious judgment come down upon uh, my little sister for doing this terrible dastardly deed. And my mother took advantage of that situation and knowing that it wasn't a good opportunity to punish the innocent three-year-old who really didn't know the difference, simply to explain to her, hey, this is something you don't do. But really, there was a lesson to be learned for me, who I thought my self-righteousness, that I was the perfectly innocent one. I mean, here I was the victim, right? I mean, you know, in this terrible crime, you know, it's like somebody coming along and murdering the poor person and leaving the body. I was the body laying there on the street, you know, with the chalk around it. And my mom said, you know what, hey, you need to love your sister. And it's funny that my mom knew the difference between just getting this as a concept and realizing that this, is, this starts with an action. Because at that moment, <laughs> loving my sister was the absolute last thing on my mind, I can assure you. There were lots of other thoughts going through my mind that were not loving, generous, and kind. My mom said, you know what? Even though you don't feel like it, I want you to do an act of love for your sister. I want you to give her a kiss on the cheek. Now, for a 12, 13-year-old guy, you might as well have sent him to the gallows. It was over. I mean, there's, there's lots more wonderful... Climbing Mount Everest would have been an easier feat. Uh, anything would have been an easier feat. Crawling across nails and glass for several miles would have been an easier feat. But my mom knew that I needed to learn a lesson in love. And she kept insisting. I think I remember getting a spanking because I was resisting so long. But I remember finally she just said, hey, you need to do this. And finally I surrendered. I gave my sister a kiss. But I learned a lesson that day about love. Love isn't always a feeling. Love is an action. And in reality, looking at this passage, love is obedience. Because we've been given the command to love, not as we would love each other, or even, even the standard of me loving other people as much as I love myself. Because let's face it, sometimes you don't love yourself very well, right? You do some things to yourself that aren't very good. Sometimes that's not always the best standard. That's why Christ says, no, I'm going to reiterate the standard. I'm going to give you a new commandment. The standard is now not the way you love yourself. It's how I love each and every one of you. And that's what I had to learn. Love is an action. This is the standard. And Christ is saying this about the believers, all of us together. <coughs> So when it's said numerous times, you've probably heard this, if the, if the believers in the church love each other unconditionally, we'll turn the world upside down. Um, I hope I'm not going to be straying out too far on a limb here, but I was talking to the leader in one of the other churches in the community. And, of course, you guys know their pastor's resigning. They're going to a stage now where they don't have a pastor. So I, out of the goodness of my heart, I think I'm, my board is behind me on this, we said, I said, hey, if you guys, there's ever a Sunday where, you know, you need somebody, you just can't find anybody to preach, you're welcome to come and join us for a service. And that leader in the church told me, he said, we would do that, except that I would be afraid that some people in that church would stand up and leave. I was surprised. I told him, I certainly hope not. I said, I don't think so. I said, but if there is anyone that would do that, please come and talk to me. Because this is not fulfilling this command. We have to love each other. Yes, we're going to disagree doctrinally. I mean, <laughs> we disagree all the time. There's people in our church that, that, that we have different doctrinal beliefs. Uh, but we know that Christ died on the cross for our sins, and we know that that's the way to heaven, and we have fellowship around that table. And it doesn't matter if, so, if my brother or sister in Christ has a difference of beliefs than I do, I can still worship around the table of Jesus Christ with him or her. And I know there's been offenses, and I know there's been struggles between the two churches, and there's been challenges, and there's been things said that should not have been said, and things done wrong that should not have been done wrong, but we should always respond in love. And if we can't show the community what true love is, we failed. And if we can't say, you know what, brother or sister in Christ, maybe I don't agree with this is the way you see this Bible verse or interpret this thing, or I see it differently. It's, it's perfectly fine to have an opinion about Scripture that's different than someone else's. That's going to happen. Okay? You know, even in this small of a group, 
We have tons of different ideas about different passages. I was talking to our elder of the church on a few Wednesday nights ago, and we were talking about uh, eternal security, and we realized that our church elder, he has a different opinion about it. Now, did that church elder tell me, oh, you know what, that's it, I'm never coming back to your church. No, he said, that's no, perfectly fine. It's okay, we'll continue to grow, talk about this together. Seek the scriptures. It's not my standard or Stony Fork Community Church's standard. It's what God, what God says, God's word. This is my standard. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to correct my beliefs about God, about the truth. But this is our underlying command, that we love one another. <clears throat> Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, says, But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we're in him. Do some of you doubt your salvation? This should be your qualifier. That you love one another. That you love the believers. <clears throat> yes, we're sinners here. I hate to admit it. We all are. But when we love each other in spite of being sinners, in spite of doing things wrong to each other, that's what? Not natural. It's supernatural. The world knows what love is because they're so deprived. I was grieved reading a story somebody posted on, on it was actually another pastor posted on Facebook and it, uh, it linked to an article about a young lady who was just ravaged for years in a row. Like, the description was hundreds of different men over there in England. And the police, everyone looked away. They didn't have to do anything to try to resolve that situation of abuse. The world is suffering. And you, I'm sure you're hearing about in the news what's going on in the Middle East. You, know, you probably know even better than I do. They, they know what evil is. They see it. They witness it. They experience it. If we're not being loving, we're not loving each other in spite of, without any qualifications on loving each other in Christ. That's the love of Christ. Do we want to know Christ? We need to know his love for the, each other and the believers. God loved the world, but he also loves the church even that much more. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, We love him because he first loved us. You know, we might have read over that verse and just totally miss it. I know I have so many times. I remember reading something about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he, he both based an entire treatise on that one simple little phrase. And when he opened it up, I realized there is so much there in that one verse. We love him because he first loved us. Again, remember that example thing? Remember the child doesn't know, really, until it's seized by example? That's all of us, really. That's when we look into the mirror of God's Word, we look into the story of, of love. That's really what God's Word is. It's a story of love. story of the ultimate love. We look into that, we realize how far, fall, far we short, how far we fall short. But the statement tells the truth. We only love God because He first loved us. Because he reached out to us. It's purely a response. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Whoa. Whoa. I mean, do not leash that verse in. Do not try to put it in the parameters of your rationalization of saying, oh, well, I, you know, I don't have to love so-and-so because you know, they're of a different doctrinal persuasion than I am, or, or they do this on Saturday night that I don't agree with. I don't have to love them anymore. No, there is no parameters on this. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Oh, there's really a powerful illustration there. If you want to connect with the spiritual realm, what God is saying is that you first got to connect through these bodies that carry around spirits, right? Because God loved each of these people in here. And when we don't, we don't begin to identify who God is, and we don't begin to identify, we can't even understand or fathom God's love until we first begin to try to love the people that He loves. This commandment we have, seen, we have from him that is that he who loveth God also, God loveth his brother also. The two go together. You cannot separate the two. We cannot isolate ourselves from everyone else and say, oh, I love God. I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I, 
You know, this is my spiritual quest. No, who are we worshiping? We're worshiping ourselves. <clears throat> the curse. This is our final problem. We have the, the, the crucifixion, we have the commandment, and we have the curse. The reality is we're all going to fail, right? Let's look, let's look again in our passage here, verses 36 through 38. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? And Jesus answered him, Whither thou goest, thou cannot follow me. He's saying, hey, I'm going to die. There's going to be a separation here. But thou shalt follow me afterwards. But eventually you're going to be going to heaven, is what he's, he's promising him. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? And I will lay down my life for thy sake. You know, sometimes we get a little hard on Peter, and we're like, hey, you know, Peter, he's just a misunderstanding guy, and... You know, you know, here he is, the guy that runs around chopping people's ears off, and he's jumping out of boats and, and trying to walk on water. He's just, no, I think God loved Peter. You know, yeah, sure, Peter didn't do it right all the time, but he did it. Remember love being an action? He did it. He's willing to jump out there, take the risks. When everybody else is sitting there huddled in the boat, well, what's going on here? You know, Peter's like, hey, I'm going to find out what it's like to walk on water. I'm going to explore God. I'm going to take the challenges. I'm going to seek. I'm going to search. I'm going to try to find. Jesus doesn't necessarily rebuke him for trying, for jumping into it. But he gives him the reality, and that is that we all fail. We're all going to fail. You know, some of us, we think, oh, you know, if I was there, <laughs> I wouldn't have denied Christ. You know, I, I wouldn't. No. Do we really honestly think we're better than Peter? I mean, Peter is, became a leader in the church. Jesus answered, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Jesus is just very real with him. He says, Hey, you're going to fail this. We're going to fail in this commandment. We've all been given. What did, we just explained this is a commandment to each and every one of us. But we're all going to fail sometimes. There are going to be times we're not loving. Is, do we give up and say, oh, You know what? I just can't do this. I'm a failure. That's it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, which should be next verse. There we go. For, though, for there is none, not a just man on earth that, do, that doeth good and sinneth not. We all do it. Do we just give up and say, ah, pff, whatever, you know, I'm a failure at loving other people. That's just the way I am. And, you know, that's my natural man. And I'm just going to stay, you know, unloving and nasty and mean and rude to people because that's just my personality. No. We need to go back again to the first two things, the crucifixion and the commandment. And that's the reality, is what's, what's being said here. Jesus is very real to me. He says, hey, you're going to fail, Peter. In fact, you're going to fail before the morning light even comes. And that's reality for all of us, right? I mean, the sun doesn't even go down, and we failed in this commandment. I can think of so many times I've been unloving to the people I care for the most much less the people that God has called me to serve, much less the people that I know I need to be a witness and a testimony to. We're going to fail, but that does not change the first two points, the crucifixion and the commandment. The love of God, that unconditional love of Christ for us, that enduring love of Christ, and the commandment to continue to follow his example. And that's really our, our, our two, two final points here. Christ loves you, the crucifixion, he's willing to die for you. And we're still to love others. It doesn't change anything. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. This un unconditional love should be our next verse here. The Lord hath appeared of old, of old, I love that statement, unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I will draw thee. Does God know that I fail doing this commandment? Yes, he does. Does God change what he, how he feels about me because of this commandment? Because I fail in this commandment? No. You know, you could come to this church and miss all the points that I say. You, know, you just come, just ignore them, just move on, walk on. But if there's one thing I want you to take home, and that is the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how low you go. It doesn't matter what failure you feel like is what has disqualified you from the love of Christ. It doesn't matter how far you've run from God or how, how terrible the deeds you've done or how unloving you've been to so many people. 
Christ is still there waiting for you to turn around, and he's waiting with open arms. He's smiling. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with thy loving kindness, I have drawn thee. God draws us even when we're resisting and running away from him. So many of us can see that. I mean, we have some older gray-haired people in this room. that They look back in their life and they go, you know what? Why did I choose God in the first place? Yes, I did choose him, but I saw the hand of God drawing me, putting me in the right places, showing me what I needed to show, opening my heart to be able to accept it. And I remember even when I was younger thinking about God saving me, I remember thinking, you know what, if I'm going to make it to heaven, I'm going to make it to heaven with God dragging me, kicking and screaming. You know, that's God's mercy. He still loves us. He just reaches out and pulls us back. And he says, hey, this is my love that will not change. I will draw thee with an everlasting love. I will draw thee with my loving kindness. If we fail, remember this fact. God still loves you. God still loves you unconditionally. You will not be able to begin to love others until you realize that God loves you unconditionally. We talked about this morning, you know, a mother having a little baby, right? I mean, is we <laughs> that little baby, somebody was sharing it, you know, the little baby comes out screaming and crying, right? You know, it's naked, it's screaming and crying. And really, I mean, you can imagine, it's not exactly the most socially accepted thing to do, you know? Run around screaming and crying naked, you know? But uh, it's really the reality of all of us, right? We're all in sinners. But does that mother, you know, I've, I've witnessed my wife birth three babies, and I've never seen her look down and go, wow, look at this terrible baby screaming and crying. Every single time, she loves that child unconditionally. Doesn't matter what that child is doing wrong or has done wrong. She still loves it because it's her child. And that's the love of a father. Yes, maybe we haven't had a perfect father. But God says, I will be a father to the fatherless. And even David writes in Psalms, he says, even if my mother and my father forsake me, I know that I have a father in heaven that will never forsake me. Sorry, that was kind of a New, Ke New King Kevin version. <laughs> Final point, we're still to love others. And I'm sorry, I've kind of run long here, but we're going to wrap up with this. We're still to love others. God loves us unconditionally. We still love others unconditionally. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect, that's those of us who call us Charles Christians, that's the people who come to the body, or part of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, part of his church, Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. Is it hard to forgive sometimes? Yeah, the harder the offense, the harder it is to forgive. If any man quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity. Charity? What is that? Wait a minute. Is that, is that right? No, it's, that's love. It's interesting that they were translating through doing the King James, and they got to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and a translator who had been working on the Old Testament in Hebrew switched over and came into the New Testament. And up to that point, the translators had just been translating agape, love. And the guy that came in, he said, you know what, you guys are doing this wrong. It's not just purely love. Agape is so much more than just love. It's an action. It's, 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 it's so much more than that. He said, you need to use the word charity. And even though charity wasn't really a word even at that time that people used very much, he said, you need to use a different word so that way people understand that there's so much more to agape than just a simple love. It's giving everything. It's, it's flowing. It's sacrificing yourself for someone else. You know, we think of charity today even as giving to the poor, but it's even so much more than that. It's giving myself for someone else. Laying down my life for someone else. And that's what Paul's saying, hey, agape each other. Love each other as Christ loved you all. <laughs> Which is the bond of perfectness. This is what bonds us together. This is what holds us together. I remember... And please don't tell, take this as me trying to say that my 
offense trumps yours because I'm sure there's, there's an offense in your life that you're thinking back of someone who's offended you or done something wrong to you that's a terrible thing. I don't want to minimize that in any way. But I remember <clears throat> working in a mission agency. We were working overseas in Russia, actually. And I remember there was this certain particular young man who, for some reason, I don't know what happened, but I guess a relationship broke down or something. I, he just didn't like me or whatever. He, just, he went around spreading nasty rumors about myself and another person, trying to discredit us in every way, tear down a reputation. I remember for years afterwards, I was always like, oh, I'm a forgiving guy, it's fine, you know, it's whatever, I can forgive this kind of offense. For years afterwards, I would, whenever I thought of that young man, I thought of it in such a negative sense. Finally, years later, I realized I have not forgiven this guy for what he did. And I realized I need, if I'm going to have the love of Christ, I need to let it go. You know what someone was sharing with us in the discipleship class? about when they finally forgave some of the people in their past that did terrible things to them. There was a freedom there. If you want to live in Christ, have the freedom of Christ, we've got to learn to forgive and love each other. And that's what Paul is saying in Colossians. He says, hey, there, if any, there's, there's quarrels, right? If any man have a quarrel against any, he's saying there is some problems here in the church. There's some of you that have offended others of you. But what he's saying is that, hey, you need to forgive like Christ forgave you. Again, you individual. So do also do ye. And we need to bring back that old English word, ye, again. <laughs> ye, you specifically. Not just you as a group, but you as an individual. Let's go ahead and bow for prayer. We're going to close this out. <clears throat> There is only one way we can fulfill this command, and that is through surrender. Us realizing we cannot fulfill this command. With every eye closed, every head bowed. Again, this is, I know I've stressed this a lot of times in my sermons, but this is something between you and God. Don't be thinking about, oh, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this so they could start to forgive so-and-so. No, this is between you and God. You realizing, is there someone in my heart that I haven't forgiven? Is there someone in my life that I've been unloving to that I need to go back and plead for their forgiveness? I'm sure there's someone in each and every one of hearts because we're all failures at this. We all fail. Ask God for the grace. For God, it says, for God resists the proud. But he giveth, what? Grace to the humble. So when we come to the throne of grace and we say, God, I can't do this. I cannot love even my spouse the way I'm supposed to love them. I can't even love my brothers and sisters in Christ in my fellowship the way I'm supposed to love them. I can't even love the world the way God has called me to love the world and preach the gospel to the world. When we do that, then God gives us the grace necessary to be overcomers. God gives us the grace to be able to forgive. God gives us the grace to be able to love when others have offended us. God gives us the grace to be able to humble ourselves and go back and say, will you please forgive me? Dear Lord Jesus, God, if there's anyone here this morning that has resisted that grace, God, I pray that you would help break their heart. This is not a state that you want us to live in. God, if I have in any way taken up offense against somebody else and been unloving to someone else, God, help forgive me, change me. Change us all, Lord. Help us to be repentant before your throne of grace, realizing that we cannot follow this command. There's just absolutely no way in us that we simply need your love to flow through us to others. Help us, Lord, to be a channel only, a humble, repentant channel, simply passing on the love of Jesus Christ to all that we come in contact with. Pray these things in your name. Amen.